Hello everyone, today is Friday of week three, so if you're lighting candles, make sure that you light the third one today. And this week we have been studying peace. We saw how Jesus brought peace um, with his birth, how he brought peace uh, to his ministry, and how he promised peace through the Holy Spirit for believers that we have now. And Today, we're going to look at the peace that Jesus is going to bring in the future, okay? And so to do that, <laughs> we are going to be in the book of Revelation. Now, Revelation's at the very end of your Bible. It was written by John, the apostle John, and he, it was written while he was in exile on an island called Patmos. Um, all the other apostles had been martyred, and he got in trouble, but he was allowed to live as long as he stayed on the island. And while he was there, he received a vision and an angel actually told him to write it down for us. And so this is a book of prophecy. Prophecy books are about things that happen in the future. This particular one has not come to fulfillment yet. So this is in our future, um, whether it's literally during our physical lifetime or whether it's in our spiritual, well, it's always in our spiritual future for believers. And so that's what we're going to take a look at. Now, I'm going to preface this with Revelation is a, a very heavy book. Um, pastors have preached on it for over a year every Sunday. I mean, you could really go a long time studying this book. Obviously, we're not going to get that in depth. Um, and a lot of theologians will debate back and forth over details of it because, again, this is to happen in the future. So, um, you know, some of it may be vague or we don't understand all the way and that's okay. It's okay. <laughs> um, but we are going to focus on the peace and the hope that revelation brings to the believer. Okay. Cause really revelation is a book of peace and hope for the believer. And all of those theologians will agree with that. <laughs> so, um, that's what we're going to focus in on. We're going to start with Revelation 19, 11 through 16. Then I saw heaven opened and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true and in righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood and the name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Okay, so there is a lot in here and I understand that. <laughs> But what's important for our lesson today, for what we're focusing in on today, is that this is Jesus, okay? This is Jesus coming in on a white horse. We know that it is him because of the names that are given in this paragraph. He is called the Word of God. Jesus is the Word of God. Um, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, we know that is also Jesus. So we know that this rider on the white horse is Jesus. Now, why is he coming? He is coming to judge and make war. Now, that doesn't sound very peaceful, does it? <laughs> um, but that's what's happening. So um, that's the big thing you need to remember here um, is that here Jesus is coming in. Now, he's coming in as a conqueror. He's coming in as king, right? King of kings, Lord of lords. He is not coming in um, to serve. He is coming in to, let's just say, lay down the law, right? Um, at this point in time, that's why he he is here. And this is what we see here. This is why he's on a white horse. This is why he's getting ready to make war. Um, we see images of, you know, a uh, robe dipped in blood. And um, he has an army with him who are also on white horses. So when you get the feeling of war, that is accurate, okay? Now, we're going to get a little further in <laughs> and you'll see the piece that we've been talking about, okay? So we're going to move to Revelation chapter 19, verse 17, 
through chapter 20, verse 3. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, Come, gather for the great supper of God, to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit, and shut it and sealed it over him, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Okay, so that's pretty heavy, right? We see here that Jesus has come. He wages war against the enemies who have gathered, okay? And in previous chapters, you, you see some of these people like the false prophet and others, the beasts, right? And so we're not going to get all into that, but everybody Jesus is fighting is his enemy. And he defeats them. And basically the angel is saying, you know, hey birds, come pick at the flesh of all the dead carcasses. That's really what we're reading here. And you're thinking, wow, Laura, this is really violent for Christmas. <laughs> and I can see your point. But we're going to move here in a minute and we're going to see where this brings peace. At this point, of, up through all of history since Adam to this point, right, Satan um, has been allowed to uh, run around on the earth uh, so as demons, right, and to influence people, people have been allowed to sin. Um, you had a, a choice, you know, you have a choice, or you believe in Jesus or you're not, and those who choose not to believe in Jesus are against Jesus. And this is the time period where, you know, we're going to have an end to a lot of this. So we see here that Satan is bound up thrown into the lake of fire, and he's going to be there for a thousand years. Um, and so that's a big deal. And, and that's part of what I want to emphasize here is that this is not what happens to believers. Okay. So when Jesus comes to, to bring the wrath of God and in, in the judgment, that is not for believers. It's for unbelievers. Now, we're going to move to Revelation 20, 4 through 15. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea, and they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. I saw the dead great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. 
And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Okay, so here we see that... There are a lot of people who have been martyred uh, for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God. And those who managed to go through the end time events, basically chapters uh, previous to this, um, that did not give in and made sure that they stayed firm on the word of God and that they followed Jesus and they didn't give in. Um, to worshiping anything else, um, they reign with Jesus for a thousand years. Now, a lot of people will argue about the specifics of who these people are, but that's what's important for today is that these are believers, okay, and um, and they are going to worship with Jesus for a thousand years. Now, during this time, um. You know, every all the bad actors <laughs> have been, um, you know, put away, imprisoned, all of that. We just read that. And um, but when the thousand years are ended, they are released, and sat Satan basically gets a lot of um, beings together to basically try to take over, to try to take all the power for himself. And it's not allowed to happen, and they are thrown into um, the lake of fire and sulfur, and they are going to be tormented day and night. So Satan is released, tries to take back power, fails, and he's thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur with the others that are still down there. And so at this point, um, they are there forever and ever. There is no getting out. So where Satan was released from a time after the thousand years, it it doesn't ever happen again. Okay. And so then we see everything kind of um, goes out of John's vision and he sees a, a white throne and a person sitting on it. And then he sees that these books are being opened. Okay. And then all of a sudden, anybody <laughs> who has been a human at any point in history is tossed up and they are put before these books. Now, the book of life represents, basically, it's the names of everyone who's put their faith in Jesus. So if you're a believer, if you've put your faith in Jesus, then your name is in this book of life. Okay. And that's important for you to remember. Okay. Um, and so here we see at this time, this is where we say, your name is in the book of life. You are not going <laughs> to the lake of fire and sulfur. If you're not in the book of life, though, you are. And that is why the book of Revelation sometimes gets um, a bad rap, saying it's a, a book of doom and gloom. Because for the believer, or for the unbeliever, it is. Um, this is, there's no going back at this point, you know. Um, if you have not put your faith in Jesus, you are going to lake of fire forever, like literally ever. Um, and so here, but for the believer, we see, you know, you come up and Jesus is like, Hey, the penalty has been paid. You know, you're in the book of life. You don't, you don't get the punishment for sin because Jesus took it for you. And that, of course, is our hope. But this is when the eternal peace that we talked about is ushered in. Okay, so now we have all evil gone, right? All the ungodly gone. All the sin gone. Okay, it's either gone into the lake of fire or Jesus has paid for it. Um, it's all gone. So what's left? is what is righteous and what is godly, right? And that is what we're going to read about now. Revelation 21, 1 through 4. 
Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Now there shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. That is our eternal peace, and it's literal, okay? So God is going to dwell with his people, right? And there's not going to be mourning or crying. There's not going to be pain. Um, there's not going to be death. There, um, we will have new bodies. We will be um, sanctified and, and made perfect. And we are going to be with God and we will be at peace. We're at peace with each other. Uh, we will be at peace with God. Um, and we are made righteous through Jesus' blood so God can be with us. And if you really think about it, if there's no mourning, no death, no crying, no pain, if all the former things have passed away, meaning sin, right? All those things, death, all of the things of that former earth, if they've all passed away, what's left? Peace. We're at peace. What is there to not be at peace about? Okay, so we will have that eternally. Okay, we will be at peace with God eternally. We will be at peace with other believers eternally. We won't be debating over, <laughs> uh, you know, all of these theological things. God will be with us, right? That is the peace that Jesus brings during his second advent. When he comes back to earth, it's going to be war for a little bit, but that's to usher in the peace, to usher in the peace for his people. And that is what we have to look forward to. So as we finish out this week on peace, um, I hope this brings a little bit of peace to your heart to know that um, when time as we understand it ends, that we will be living eternally in peace with Jesus. All right, let's pray. Lord, we just thank you so much for coming to earth the first time, for giving us your Holy Spirit to, to bring peace and wisdom to our lives. Lord, we just thank you for the peace that you will bring to us at the end of time, Lord, that, that you love us so much that if we just trust and put our faith in you, that, that you will give us this eternal peace. And Lord, just remind us of that constantly. When, when we get frustrated with how things here on earth are going, when we are overwhelmed by, by evil and injustice, Lord, bring to our hearts and to our minds what we've read about today, that, that one day you will bring justice and you will bring us in an era of peace that will last forevermore. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen.